Hello, everyone. Today on The Final Bar, I'm talking with Bill Baruch from uh, Blue Line Futures. We'll talk about this choppy market environment today, unchanged essentially for the S&P, sort of chopping out right around the zero level going into the close. Might be finishing a touch in the negative, but overall kind of a uh, sloppy, floppy, sideways uh, feel to the tape today after yesterday's nice run push uh, off of the lows from, uh, from last week. Defensive stuff at the top of the list with real estate and healthcare, number one and number two. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the final bar. Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the Chief Market Strategist here at StockCharts.com in a rainy Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we break down the activity in the markets using the power of stock charts, using data visualization techniques, the technical analysis toolkit to better understand investor psychology, to better uh, sort of get a sense of the crowd behavior and crowd dynamics and focus on the message embedded in, uh, in the indicators of price and breadth and sentiment. Today, we have a number of really uh, interesting things to talk about, try to break down this market environment in a little more detail. We're gonna focus on price itself, a look at the S&P, some, uh, some key stocks that are on the move and uh, what we might be able to draw from them. Names like FedEx and others sort of threatening to turn higher, right? Uh, setting in potentially a bottom. We'll look at some of those signs and what we would need to see to turn, turn a little bit more optimistic. But at the end of the day, the S&P is still coming off of some fairly significant lows. We're going to dig into breadth analysis a little bit, focus on indicators like the bullish percent index, uh, which for the S&P 500, still fairly negative. We'll look at all of that and more here in, uh, in a few moments. We have great guests on the show. I'm excited to have uh, Bill Baruch from Blue Line Futures back on the show today. Tomorrow on the 23rd, we have Mary Ellen McGonigal from uh, MEM Investment Edge. Then coming up next week, we have uh, a bit of a break at the beginning of the week. Monday and Tuesday, we're going to show you some special programming on Monday, a focus on the use of technical indicators, some best practices on how to use indicators as part of your thought process. We'll also focus on the signal that is embedded in price on individual stocks. That's on Tuesday, the 28th. Then on the 29th, Wednesday, we have Samantha LaDuke from LaDuke Trading joining us on the show. Also wanted to let you know, I will be speaking at the Money Show Virtual Expo tomorrow. This is on Thursday, June 23rd, right at noon Eastern. I'm going to be doing a session called the most important chart of the day. We'll talk about the first thing you look at every day. I'll share with you the chart that I look at the first thing every morning. It is the beginning of my morning coffee routine, why that first chart is so important, what it should tell you about the overall market trends and the market environment. So make sure you go to stockcharts.com slash money show to sign up for that free event. Let's continue on today's show with our market recaps. I mentioned a choppy feel to the tape today. Let's look at the evidence and see what price is telling us about the underlying strength and or weakness in some different uh, equity areas. First off, the S&P finishing down about 0.1%, not too far off of yesterday's close. This is around 37.60. And what's interesting, the S&P actually opened lower early afternoon around 2 p.m. all the way up to 3,800, finishing right about where uh, we finished the day yesterday. So again, sort of a sideways choppy, noisy, but directionally sideways sort of feel to uh, to the markets today. Mid caps and small caps both down about a quarter, third of a percent. No no real uh, severe weakness there. The VIX is actually pushing back below 30, to around, just above 29, around 29.10. Interest rates overall lower today with the 10-year yield down to 315. Now, yesterday got up to around 330 on the 10-year, a little higher on the, uh, on the 30-year yield. Uh, all of those down today uh, for the most part. And bond price is obviously uh, a bit higher using the TLT, which was up almost 3%. Dollar index, not too much different from uh, from yesterday. That's using the, uh, the UUP, the bullish dollar ETF. Looking at commodities, a bit of a mixed bag. Gold uh, pushing a bit higher. One of my guests last week, we were talking about gold prices and whether there was an opportunity for gold to uh, you know once again sort of reignited safe haven status, a big reason why that could happen or, or, or the really one of the ways that that would be much more likely to happen is if the dollar would cool off a bit because stronger dollar not tending to be a great environment for, uh, for stronger gold. That's sort of the wrong way uh, for, that, for that sort of trade. Weaker dollar, stronger gold could make uh, gold a, a safe haven once again. It's been choppy and it's held up okay 
while stocks have been going lower, but really not materializing with any sort of uh, uptrend for sure. Crude oil prices, by the way, finishing uh, lower in energy was the worst sector of the 11 in the S&P uh, today. Cryptocurrencies continuing to see a lot of red. Now, these are pretty uh, volatile as always. And uh, I'm just coming off of a couple day vacation as I was looking at the charts. Once again, I was not super surprised to see further weakness in cryptocurrencies and uh, and a lot of volatility. That's sort of what I think you should be expecting for quite some time. Bitcoin is right around that 20,000 level, by the way. It's been much of uh, the last day sort of bouncing off potential support. On Bitcoin, on Ether, you often see movements around big round numbers. That's actually a known phenomenon, not just with cryptocurrencies, but with a lot of asset classes. A lot of things tend to gravitate towards big round numbers. Um, and it's a psychological thing, I would argue more than anything. It's we tend to focus on uh, on those big round numbers and think about what that means for a particular chart. So Bitcoin bouncing off 20,000, pretty important. Pr- pretty important. That is Ethereum uh, down near 1,000, which would be a pretty key level uh, as well. 2,000 and other uh, key uh, round numbers have been pretty important uh, for those. But again, overall, a lot of red in the 10 most liquid uh, coins that we track. A lot of negativity. If you think of that as a proxy for speculation, telling you some further weakness. Now, the daily chart of the S&P, this is why things are sort of in uh, in, a, in a no man's land, a bit of a question mark with the S&P, because you're seeing short-term strength, right? Bouncing off of uh, the lows last week, we had the long holiday weekend with, uh, with Juneteenth on Monday. Last two trading sessions closing above the open, both of them closing off of uh, the uh, the new lows for the year that we experienced uh, last week. So we sort of bouncing off of that 3650 level, touching 3800 today, but showing a bit of short-term strength. Now, what you always have to remember, what I always try to remind people is, is to separate short-term strength or weakness with the longer-term trends, right? And, and depending on your time frame, that is how you should think of things. I, I tend to be trying to look out about a month or two, I would say is sort of my average horizon that I personally am trying to think about. So Short-term bounces, short-term fluctuations, short-term volatility, a lot of times are a little more noise. Thinking about how that relates to the long-term trend, I think is a real opportunity for a lot of investors that are not day trading, but are just trying to think about more of the uh, the overall trend. So you know, my question in this sort of environment is, is there enough of a rally that would make you think that this is something more right, than just a short-term bounce? I mean, markets will bounce off of New lows. I would be blown away and and uh, and surprised if that did not happen, right? So that's an expected behavior. The question is, do you get any meaningful gains that really materialize? So what do you look for in this environment? You start to look at the trends overall. The pattern for the S and P over the last six months has been a fairly consistent pattern of lower highs and lower lows. Which means if we do rally here, you have quite a lot of ground to make up before you'd be able to make a new swing high. The S P would have to get up all the way to around 4,200 to be able to eclipse the most recent swing high in June. That's the challenge for this sort of market to show recovery. And you remember that is kind of what happened back here in uh, late February, early March. We made a bit of a higher low, although on a closing basis, made a lower low into March and then rallied. We stalled out right at the previous highs. And that's a pretty common uh, pattern, right? You sort of rally Instead of really following through above the most recent swing high, you stall out there. There's an indication that there's an exhaustion of buyers, and then the next leg lower can happen. That's going to most likely continue to happen in the S&P until it does it, right? And the last new low ends up being the final one. And so what do you look for? You look for a new swing high, look for a higher low, some indication that buyers are coming in. At this point, I treat it, I think of it as a, uh, as a short-term sort of counter-trend rally, until proven otherwise. As we mentioned in our recent shows, by the way, uh, last uh, couple of weeks, um, overall, I'm seeing a lot of, um, uh, a lot of uh, strength, or, or sorry, a lot of weakness in some of the breadth indicators. We're going to talk a little bit later in, a, in our segment, Banking on Breadth, particularly about some of the, uh, the breadth data and how some of it's rotated to, uh, to the downside. So I don't want to get too much into, uh, into the weeds on there, but I did want to mention, because we didn't have a show uh, a live show on Friday. My market trend model that I tend to follow pretty closely, I updated update every Friday at the close, remaining negative, right? So yesterday or last week, obviously a lot of weakness going into uh, the long holiday weekend. Long-term, medium-term, short-term for me, um, still showing bearish. So, so for me, that tells me to think risk off until the evidence mounts that things are getting uh, are getting more significant, that there's more of a meaningful rally and less just to bounce off of the uh, the lows. If you're looking at the sector returns, by the way, as we finish up our market recap segment, sort of a defensive feel uh, overall to the sector movements today. Although energy, the worst performing one, let's look at a chart or two in the energy space if we uh, if we have time. The top three sectors 
real estate, healthcare, utilities, and all of which I would generally describe as fairly defensive sectors. Healthcare is kind of a mix, though. It's got a lot of different stuff in there, but utilities and real estate, you really only are rotating there if you're looking for income, if you're looking for stability, low volatility, and a chance to sort of ride things out. From there, a big gap down to communication services, and then everything else was essentially flat to down uh, for the day. Let's look at a chart or two in the energy space. DVN is one of those that I like to highlight because at times it's been one of the top ranked uh, stocks in our uh, large cap uh, universe using the scooter rankings, the stock charts technical ranking. Still 97th percentile, which is you know pretty decent, right? That's a pretty uh, pretty powerful trend. Here's what's happened on the chart of DVN though. A couple of weeks ago, we're making new all-time highs. The RSI is becoming overbought. It's making new relative highs for the year. That's a strong chart top to bottom. There's nothing to be really disappointed with from a trend following perspective. That's a strong, uh, strong performer. Look at what's happened in the last couple of weeks, though. We've now uh, undercut the 50-day moving average. Now, that's happened on limited basis uh, since November of 2020. But for the most part, we found support at the 50 days. So failing to hold that is one area of, uh, of potential concern. From there, I'm looking to the left to see where we're at relative to key support levels. And we're kind of right there. If you look right around 55, that's where we bottomed out in uh, April on a closing basis, right around 55. We traded below there the one day uh, in mid-April, but that ended up being uh, the, the most recent short-term low before a rally into, uh, into new highs. We're right back at that support level and oversold. It'd be interesting to see if charts like DVN can mount any sort of meaningful bounce off of that potential support level. Let's take a quick commercial break. We'll be back with today's guest, Bill Baruch. We'll see you in a minute. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to The Final Bar. This is Dave Keller here at StockCharts.com. It's great to be back live with you here on Wednesday, June 22nd. A couple of quick announcements before we get to today's guest, Bill Baruch. First off, we welcome your questions. We are here to help point you in the right direction. These are uncertain times, and we absolutely know it, but I would argue technical analysis is a really good way to try to make sense of these uh, volatile markets. Our email is thefinalbar at StockCharts.com. We're on Twitter at FinalBarSCTV. We're on YouTube. Put a comment below the video you're watching on our Stock Charts YouTube channel. We'll gather all those questions. We'll do another mailbag segment on Friday of this week. We'll hope to hear from you soon. Also, go to StockChartsTV.com. That's our on-demand platform. Great expert uh, commentary and thoughts from people like Bill Brook and many others, uh, all on demand. Also, special market outlooks by Martin Pring, Larry Williams, uh, many, many others, all for free at StockChartsTV.com or on your mobile device. Just search for Stock Charts TV on demand. I want to welcome on today's guest, Bill Baruch. Bill's the president of uh, Blue Line Futures. And uh, Bill, it's great to see you again. Thanks for uh, joining us on the uh, on the show in volatile times. It's good to see you. Thanks for having me on again. It's really a pleasure to be here. So, uh, you know, help us make sense of things. We're looking at a ratio that you shared with me, the NASDAQ 100, the Qs versus the XLP. What is this ratio telling, uh, telling you? It, you know, right now, I mean, it's telling me that we're, we're trying to find a nice little, uh, you know, bottoming pattern here. And it, the, this relationship of where, you know, tech is going to lead higher relative to the more safer consumer staples is, is given us signals, uh, you know, not, not going, I mean, not only going far back, but even just in March, you know, you're going to see the way it sort of bottomed out in March and then gave us that, that big rally through, uh, through April. So I'm looking for this to give us a nice, you know, nice signal. And I think right now we're, we're looking at what it could be an inverse head and shoulders building at, at a, crucial level of support going back to, um, you know, when we rallied through, uh, through the early part of COVID in 2020, June 2020 area. Yeah. So this chart we're looking at, Bill, is going back about five, six years or so, right back to 2017, which sort of you'd notated on this chart, sort of hitting a key support level. Is this a level we should be focusing on? What would this uh, suggest? Yeah. As we're coming back down into this, where we were June, uh, June, 2020, I believe it is. And, mm. and, and, and it's very significant consolidation that took place there. And then the market legged up again. And again, like I said, I, I do believe tech is going to have to be a leader out of here. And the NASDAQ 100, the Qs, 
it, you're going to get the largest largest stocks in the world basically that are driving that thing. And and so the Apple, the Microsoft, Amazon, Alphabet, they're going to have to show up here to dig this market out of uh, you know out of this bottom. And um, you know I I think that consumer staples are going to be really outpaced. And, and I'm looking mm -hmm. for for that sort of thrust higher in the risk on stocks in order to tell us that, that that's going to be taking place right now. Your daily chart of the S of this uh, ratio, by the way, but we're looking at uh, now. So we're looking back the last year or two um, and you'd mentioned sort of a potential head and shoulders bottom here, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah nice little inverse head and shoulders bottom. And really what I'm looking at is just that the rounded out bottom, similar to what we had in, in March. I think the inverse head and shoulders gives us a little more construction in order kind of to, to look at that, that thrust higher. Um, you know, I, I, there are a lot of charts here that, that, um, you know, find the NASDAQ as well as the S&P by themselves. Some could argue they're in maybe no man's land. And there's, you know, what does that tell us? It doesn't really define much. Take a look at the Dow. The Dow is actually hitting the pre COVID levels, the, the, the highs pre COVID and a, a big retracement. So, you know, I think if if, we're, if we define the S and P and the Nasdaq in a bit of no man's land, w you know what's going to drive us out of here. And you know, looking at this, like I said, the, the Qs would have to lead. The, the biggest stocks in the world are going to have to lead out of here. And I'm looking for for the relative strength against that. Or, or is the most beaten down sectors, you know, are they not making new lows? I mean, individual stocks are and have been making new lows, but are these are these uh, you know as a relative basis, are they not going to make new lows? Looking back. You know, over the recent weeks, Arc K hasn't made a new low. So just looking at some of that stuff, the, the most the most beaten down uh, trash. I mean, the, the, what has been trash almost is is uh, you know is that going to lead us out of there? You make a number of great points in there, Bill, and and you're I mean you're absolutely right, of course, right? The technology, consumer discretionary, sort of those fang like or fangy sectors are the ones that tend to lead out of them are market bottom. Right? That, that's a good place to to look. What we only have about about a minute left, Bill, but. Let's say that that strength does not come. We don't see the rotation in the queues. It feels like further weakness. What kind of things would you do or should individual investors be doing to protect themselves if they would start to see signs of further weakness going forward? Well, you know, if you're if you're managing a portfolio, you definitely want to have some cash, you know, on, mm. you know, that's that's is ready to go. Um, not necessarily put it to put it to work, but you know, you shouldn't be fully deployed until you have some certainty here that we're moving out of this. Um, you know, going back to last week, I, you know, it, there was, I thought that maybe we could bottom through quadruple witching, but I'm not just indiscriminately throwing cash at things, looking at the, uh, the statistic coming out of that week. And, you know, one thing I did want to touch on real quick is if somebody's looking at, um, you know, the volume in some of these futures contracts, you're, you're either looking at the front month continuous contracts or the, or the contract itself. If you have a futures platform, you might be able to see the actual commodity exchange volume. The Russell 2000 set for, for the actual contract um, of all months being traded, set a rec we record weekly volume last week in the quad witching. And the S&P and NASDAQ both had the most weekly volume going back to March 2020. So I'm looking at that volume, you know, as well as a big indicator because because capitulation is defined by volume. But but again, you know, let's let's lean back to your question here. The S&P and the NASDAQ, they are in a little bit of no man's land. So if we can't get out of just more simple price action, 3,800, kind of closing above that FOMC, level that FOMC settlement in the S&P that we failed at today, and we continue to see selling that comes in. And yeah, this market is extremely vulnerable. And, and I think we could find it back to 3,400, 3,500 in the S&P. Now, I'm not sitting here saying that's going to happen, but um, I don't see a whole lot of value in protecting downside right now. So I think raising cash and, and, and having cash ready to deploy at better levels is really probably the best, best uh, way to manage your risk at this moment. I love that. Have some cash available to redeploy when the evidence tells we uh, tells us we start to rotate higher. Bill, it's great to see you. Thanks for sharing some thoughts with us and a couple of charts as well. Stay safe there, and we'll talk to you again soon. Thank you. That's Bill Brook. Bill's the uh, president of Blue Line Futures, also Blue Line Capital. Does a great job, I think, of uh, of stressing the importance of looking at the evidence. And I love that ratio. I actually don't look at that ratio very often. When he sent me those charts, and I was looking at them earlier today, I thought that was a great way just showing. You know, I often look at uh, consumer discretionary versus consumer staples. This is a really good way of capturing the leadership, right? Sort of the FANG stocks or the FANG stocks emerging in a position of strength, which I would argue, I would agree with uh, Bill, until you see that, it's hard to imagine the major benchmarks, which are really dominated by those growth, uh, those mega cap growth. Names. It's hard to imagine a meaningful recovery without those names really being a, a part of it. Great take there from, uh, from Bill Baruch. Let's continue on today's show with our next segment. 
banking on breadth. We like to dig into some of the breadth data about once a week. Uh, we refer to it often on the show, to be honest with you. And I, I often get comments talking about or questions talking about breadth indicators because I think they tell us so much about you know, not just the top level indexes. What are the indexes doing? What's price telling you? But this sort of is the next level down. What about all the individual stocks that comprise uh, those markets? I was talking with uh, Dave Landry in our last episode of the uh, of the pitch, and uh, we were talking about how it's not a stock market. It's a market of stocks. You have to remember, these are individual names that comprise these major indexes. Let's not lose the value of paying attention to some of the, uh, some of the individual data points that tell us about their uh, their performance characteristics. We're going to start here looking at a we'll look at a series of breadth charts. So I want to start here looking at the cumulative advanced decline lines for four different groups of uh, of stocks. We have the S and P on a closing basis uh, here, looking at the last year. We're then looking at the advanced decline lines for the New York Stock Exchange: large caps, mid caps, small caps. Now I have the very subjective color coded system, uh, the Dave Keller color system here: red, green, uh, amber. Depending on what I see with these uh, with this breadth data, it's just a quick placeholder for me to just think about the message that I'm getting from these advanced decline lines. Basically, over the last week, all four of these have made a new uh, low for the year. So while the S and P clearly making a new low over the last uh, you know week and a half or so, um, you know some of these advanced decline lines actually had not quite done so. Last week, all of them made a new, uh, all four of them made a new low. What happens a lot of times at a bottom is you'll start to get a lack of breadth confirmation. So you see the S&P make a new low, but you'll see the breadth lines actually start to slope higher a little bit. Didn't happen in this case. You're actually getting all of them confirming the new low. And I think one of the most compelling ones is the S&P's breadth, which has often been the strongest because the mega caps overall at times have certainly been uh, in a position of strength. You saw that back here in November into January, when the advanced decline line for the S&P 500, even the mid-cap uh, AD line went to new highs, small caps did not. The New York Stock Exchange uh, did not. So one of the things I would be looking for is, does the market make a new low, but the breadth actually does not confirm that? Uh, in this case, all four of them making a new low. So as long as that continues, that's just a confirmation that uh, the trends overall are remaining uh, fairly negative. One of the other breadth charts we look at is the percent of stocks above their key moving averages. This is looking at the S&P 500 uh, percent above their 200-day, uh, and then at the bottom, percent above their 50-day moving average. As of today's close, about 18, 17%, we'll say, of the S&P 500 members are above their 200-day. Uh, Only 6% are above their 50-day. So flip that over, 94% of the members of the S&P 500 are below their 50-day moving average. What's happened here, charts like DVN, which we talked about in our market recap, these are the ones that have been holding out, right? A lot of the energy names, a lot of the names that were the outliers doing really, really well while the average stock has been struggling. Those names are all starting to rotate to the downside as well, starting to fail to hold their 50-day moving average like we saw with, uh, again, with the example of uh, DVN. So almost all of the uh, the members of the S&P 500, again, 94% of them uh, below uh, below their 50-day moving average. Now, before you say that's an obvious buy signal, look how low that is. Compared to the last couple of years, you're absolutely right. But go back to major um, uh, bear market phases, right? Like 2001, 2002, like 2008, 2009. These indicators both can get down to zero, particularly percent above their 50-day can remain down there for months on end. So just the fact that it's gone down a lot does not necessarily mean we're at some sort of bottom. That worked pretty well in the buy on the dips phase of the markets, but now there were more in, the, uh, in an established bear market phase. It's telling me to be more cautious than anything. So what do we look for here? This sort of indicator getting back above 50% would be pretty meaningful. It was worth noting in May when we had the rally uh, up to uh, just below 4,200, you see that the indicator remained below 50%, never quite was able to get above there. So what that told you is a lot of names were actually getting back above their 50-day, but most of them were remaining below. That tells you that there's still a broad decline at work, tells you to still be um, sort of cautious, if anything. The bullish percent index, kind of similar to the previous chart we just looked at, this is looking at all the members of the S&P 500 and what percent of them are in a bullish point and figure uh, uh, signal, right? Meaning the most recent signal was a buy signal. Point figure charts are a very simplistic way of measuring trend. Is Any chart is binary. It's either an uptrend or a downtrend based on its most recent signal. Um, this is telling you that about 16% of the S&P members are uh, in a bullish configuration, which again means 84% are in a bearish configuration. Now, if you look here, um, over the last six months, a number of times we broke above the 70% level. That tells you most 
of the S&P members were in a, uh, in a buy signal. Look at how that lines up with some of the most significant peaks we've seen in the S&P. Now we're in an established downtrend. We can see that this is now going very, very low. So we've broken below 30%, which is what we call a bear confirmed uh, sort, of, uh, sort of signal. You want to see this get back above 30%. If it does, that tells you there's some opportunity, right? There may be an indication that um, that enough uh, enough of a reversal is occurring um, to signal some strength. But until it gets to 30%, it's telling you still very much we're in a uh, in a downtrend. Just to round off uh, two other charts I want to get to if I can, the McClellan Oscillator, more of a short-term gauge. There's another index we have called the McClellan Summation Index, which sort of aggregates this over time, sort of like looking at a cum cumulative advanced decline line. This is more looking at the short-term um, configuration. Below the zero line, this is in a downtrend. Above the zero line, uh, it's in a, it's in a uh, in a positive trend. Really not uptrend or downtrend. I would say more bullish or uh, or bearish. As long as it remains below zero, that tells you basically the conditions are still uh, fairly uh, fairly negative. It was interesting in mid May the McClellan Oscillator got back above zero. That was actually before the bottom. That was actually as uh, in late May, as uh, as we were seeing some long lower shadows on the S and P chart, you saw the McClellan oscillator get back up of zero. Now, what this is doing is actually smoothing out advanced decline data using exponential averages. So it's looking more at the rotation and the advanced decline uh, data. So the reason why that could be helpful here is wait to see if it gets above zero. If it does, that tells you we're probably setting up for a more meaningful bounce. We have not gotten that indicator indication yet. Still negative. Finally, in our uh, discussion of breadth, I wanted to mention Marty Zweig's indicator, the Zweig breadth thrust. Now, this is an indicator. If you ask around, there are a number of different versions of this. A lot of people argue over the specifics. I tend to like just the general sense of this. Marty Zweig's thesis was after you've had breadth be fairly negative, you look for a bounce. And within two weeks, within 10 days, do we go from below 0.4 to above 0.63 or 0.65, I've heard different debates. We almost got a buy signal there in May. We didn't quite get that because it took over 10 trading days. We have now had an initiation of that Zwag breadth, breadth thrust within 10 trading days. We need to get higher. If we get a further bounce, that could be a breadth thrust signal, which could be a meaningful sign of a bottom. So a good chart to uh, keep an eye on. We need to wrap the show, folks. Go to the three and three. Let's talk about three charts in three minutes that tell the story of this market environment. In our segment, uh, Banking on Breadth, we break, broke down some of the breadth indicators. I wanted to show you a little different version of the chart that we talked about earlier. This is highlighting over the last couple of years when the bullish percent index for the S&P 500 has briefly broken below 50%, which you really haven't seen in quite some time. That was really more what it looked like in two, 2020 and even uh, later 2021. These pink, purple shaded areas are when we broke above 70% and rotated back down. Those are some pretty decent uh, selling opportunities. Yellow and red are when we've really gotten negative. Now, yellow is when we've gotten below 50%, but remained above 30. The red is when we've gotten below 30%. That happened in February, March, 2020, in April, May, 2022, and then again, right now. So overall, this is looking a lot less like viable dips, as you probably have felt from the price action, and more about meaningful downside. Chart number two is the bullish percent index on the NASDAQ 100. I loved uh, Bill Brooks charts looking at the ratio of the Qs versus the XLP. That's a ratio I don't look at like look, don't look at very often. I'm going to jot that one down. That was an interesting one. When I'm thinking about the bullish percent index on the Nasdaq, I'm seeing obviously a fairly negative uh, feel to things. You can see how this indicator has shown when Nasdaq names have attempted to lead, and we can see they've quickly gone back below 70%, sort of uh, confirming this uh, this bearish tape. We just today got back above the 30% level, which is why this is an important chart to watch. Can we get above 50%? That would be a more meaningful recovery in some of the largest of the mega cap names in tech, consumer, and communication services. Finally, FedEx, FDX, when I'm looking at this chart, this is an example of where I feel like the market has recovered to a point, but the question is, can it regain and, and, and sort of make more meaningful progress to the upside? Has it bounced off support at 200? Absolutely. Has the RSI failed to go below 40, which is more characteristic of a bull market phase? Absolutely. What has not happened, though, is we've not broken above the 200-day moving average. We've attempted that, but really haven't followed through. And that's been a problem for FedEx over the last year or two. We also have the RSI stalling out at 60, which is more characteristic of a downtrend. If the price gets above the 200-day, if the RSI gets above 60, that might convince me higher recovery. Folks, that's our show for today. Special thank you to Bill Baruch from Blue Line Futures joining us on the show. For StockCharts.com and Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be safe. Have a great night. 
Hey, Grayson Rose here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below, maybe leave us a comment, and if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're gonna bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.